Hi. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. And welcome to Human Rights Weekend. This session, Clothing, Energy, and Human Rights. My name is Baram Sadegi, and I have the great honor and maybe great responsibility to be your moderator, to be your host. And I know it comes as a shock, but English is not my first language. As a matter of fact, as someone who is born in Iran, who is living in Holland for 32 years, I have no idea anymore what my first or second or third language is. Sir, please, please you can sit over here, yes. Thank you very much and welcome, yeah. So please bear with me. So the whole session will be in English. And um, please don't forget to put your phone on silent mode. And if you want, uh, do we see the hashtags? Yes. Oh, no, that's my hashtag, yeah. If you want to see uh, the hashtags, maybe we can see it. Yes, over there, yes. Human Rights Weekend and Biz Human Rights, you want to tweet. And uh, by the way, we are recording and streaming this session. So it means that everybody, whether my panels, uh, panel members of panels uh, later, or you, everything you would like to say, do it in the microphone. Yip will come to you with a microphone later on, but she will keep the microphone and then she will hold it in her own hand. So as you can understand, because this is someone, you know, uh, these issues, you know, invite people to just tell us about this, their own research field, their own PhD, and talk like, let's say, about eight or nine minutes. Not today. <laughs> today, it would be nice because later, you know, we will have five people here, you know, ask them a question, you know, a genuine question with a question mark at the end, you know. My only task is to keep that, you know, in, in, in line, to, to organize that. So that's my only thing I'm asking you. So please allow me, having said that, please allow me to tell you something about the program. As I said, it's about the relationship between business and human rights. It's about the clothes, we, the garments we are uh, wearing on everyday basis and human rights, and under which uh, conditions the person who uh, makes those garments works. That's about that, you know. And the other issue is about the uh, uh, coal, uh, colon. And it's about the social cost of getting coal here for our energy use. And the, it's, these are issues, of course, we don't think about on everyday basis, but um, let's, now, yeah, I wouldn't say unfortunately, but the worlds of business and human rights are closely connected in many ways nowadays. So our focus will be on clothing and energy industries, because both industries, um, that th th they make it a little bit difficult to trace their abuses them that may be involved in uh, getting the production of clothes or energy here to West Europe, to our country, to our consumer, make it a little bit difficult to trace those abuses. But we have the NGO experts and company representatives who will join us for the discussion today, and we will investigate these case studies, especially in Uzbekistan, Colombia, Kazakhstan, and uh, which are closely linked to our consumptions uh, in uh, Europe when it comes, as I said, to clothes and to energy. The course of program will be like this. Uh, we will start with five talks, five pitches. People will come here and they will have a pitch, let's say, between six and seven minutes. After that, there is room for one question, whether I can ask the question or if you have a question, it's, uh, it's uh, okay, but it's not compulsory, because after that we will have a conversation with them. You can ask the question later on, but it's okay if you want to have a question. And if you don't have, I have a lot of questions over here. And um, after the, the talks, we will have a panel discussion with all the five speakers. And as I said, you can ask your questions over there. And if everything goes according to plan, we will be finished about five o'clock. Uh, let's say, inshallah, you never know. And so uh, maybe it's time to ask my uh, members of panel to the one for one to join me here. I will start with them. I will call them here. When they sit, I will tell which bio uh, is linked to which face. And uh, so within three or four minutes, we will have all the panel members here. Walter Kolk, could you please join me here? Yes, over there. Yes, Walter. 
And you know, you don't have to applaud for Pablo. But if you, yeah, yeah, OK. Walter, yeah, that's all right. That's all right. Cool. Walter, uh, Walter is a campaign leader for, uh, Pax, uh, for Pax, Pax, Pax for Peace, and is responsible for a Stop Blood Call campaign. And with his campaign, he aimed to make a difference in the li lives of people who have become victims of paramilitary groups in coal mining area of Caesar in Colombia. Cesar. Cesar. Uh, I just, yeah, thank you very much. OK, uh, so that's Walter. Uh, Joel uh, Freyhoff. Joel, would you please over there? Joel is responsible uh, sourcing manager <coughs> at Fattenfall. Did I pronounce it well? Uh, it's uh, close enough. Close, close enough? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Fattenfall. And as you probably all know, uh, Fattenfall is the parent company, is the uh, mother, mother bedrijf of our Dutch uh, Nuon company. So that's why he's sitting. But they are, their original is from uh, Sweden. Am I right? Fotoval is a Swedish state-owned company. Yes. yes, Swedish, yeah. And um, Joel is responsible for the implementation of the corporate code of conduct for suppliers within the uh, commercial trading department. And uh, especially, um, he's, um, he did uh, research on behalf of Fotoval. Fotoval? Fotoval, yeah? Fotoval. Into the human rights violations in the coal mining uh, region of Cesar in Colombia. Between 1996 and 2006, uh, many people got killed. It's a very se serious issue. It was a very serious issue, and it's still a very serious issue. And so many people were killed in, in, in during the ten, day, uh, 10 years and were displaced by uh, paramilitary groups over there. And Joel visited the region in March 2017. And based on his findings, Fatafai came to uh, action to make sure that the victims will be supported socially and legally, and that uh, reconciliation uh, dialogue uh, will be put in place. Okay. Patricia, Patricia Jorovitz, would you please join me, Patricia? Yes. <laughs> over there. Patricia, uh, founder and the director of Responsible Sourcing Network, RSN, uh, RSN, yes, and uh, champions uh, human uh, rights for vulnerable uh, communities who work in the mining and harvesting of raw materials, which can find in our products on everyday use. And currently, she sits uh, on advisory committees for several initiatives that try to improve labor conditions, such as Know Your Chain, ICCR, it's like interfaith. Interfaith Center for Corporate Responsibility. Yes, yes. Uh, for a human trafficking group and cotton campaign. And her latest project was, uh, is uh, spearheading the initiatives of YES, Y-E-S-S. -S. And it stands for? Yarn Ethically and Sustainably Sourced. OK, which aims to eliminate forced labor from cotton uh, sourcing globally. Daniel, Daniel, would you please join me? Daniel Architovsky. Co-founder and uh, co-founder of, of Unrecorded, an Amsterdam-based clothing brand that uh, focuses on sustainable basic basics for men and women. And Daniel, he uh, started his company with your uh, co-founder, uh, uh, Jole van der Mast. Yeah, correct. yeah, correct. Yeah, and it's because. Um, they believe that people will consume more conscious and sustainable when they don't have to compromise on quality, style, or price. And you are based, as a matter of fact, like five minutes walking distance from here. Am I right? Correct. Yeah, in um, what is the strat? Uh, Passier de Strat. Passier de Strat, yeah. We just actually moved, but. <laughs> oh, that's why, because I just wanted to visit your shop, but it was. Uh, Closed-ish, you know. It was, is it the shop? Is it the home? What is it? We, we in, um, in the microphone, please. Um, we um, we have an office, and we just uh, moved offices, and um, we are planning to open a store uh, in mid-Feb. In, in Amsterdam, still. Correct. Yes. Cool. Amsterdam. Thank you. Okay, Mira, Mira Ritman, would you please join me here? And Mira is the final one. Yeah, okay. Mira, thank you. Uh, Central Asia researcher for Human Rights Watch and works primarily on Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan, covering 
a wide range of human rights issues such as labor rights and freedom of assembly, association, and speech. Thank you very much for here. So let's start with uh, Wouter. And uh, you would like to start with a short video, am I right? Yes, please. Yeah. Uh, so we can just, you can watch the video over there. And then after that, you go uh, to have a talk for, let's say, about five years. So can we start the video, please? Energie maakt alles mogelijk. Energie verwarmt ons, voedt ons en verbindt ons. Maar wacht eens even. Je wist het misschien niet, maar een groot deel van onze energie wordt opgewekt met bloedkolen uit Colombia. Voor bloedkolen zijn mensen vermoord en boeren van hun land verdreven. In Colombiaanse kolengebieden zijn meer dan 3100 mensen vermoord en 55.000 mensen van hun land verjaagd. Paramilitaire commandanten hebben onder Ede verklaard dat ze hebben samengewerkt met mijnbouwbedrijven en door hen zijn betaald. Terwijl kolenmijnen en energiebedrijven grof geld verdienen aan bloedkolen, wachten slachtoffers nog steeds op fatsoenlijke compensatie. Maar zo doen we toch geen zaken. Doe mee. Ga naar www.stopbloedkolen.nl Uh, I have to start with an apology because this was supposed to be in, in English. <laughs> but uh, I think the bottom line is clear. This video shows that there's a clear connection between grave human rights violations in Colombia and our energy. So taking a stand as a consumer or as a company matters. Especially um, when you realize that the connection between Colombian coal and you is even closer than you might think. As close as the pocket in your trousers, for instance. Because it's very well possible that uh, the mobile phone you are carrying has been charged with power which has been generated from Colombian coal. Even uh, better, back a bit, if it works, because I needed another slide. <laughs> yeah. This happens all the time, right? <laughs> Situations like this. <laughs> it's a conspiracy. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, we have to go back further. To my, to my first slide, please. Or the, the one right after the, the video. Which, which shows up. Yeah, thanks. So, as you see here, uh, in the picture behind me, the connection is very close. Because some of you might recognize it, especially those who are living in the west side of Amsterdam. This is the coal-fired power plant of uh, Nuon. And by the way, this is a picture that has been taken from my balcony yesterday morning. Because every morning when I open my curtains, this is my view as a daily reminder of my work and specifically of the mission we have together with victims of blood coal, which is to assure that mining companies who have benefited from their misery uh, will in the future be responsible also to compensate them. And to be honest, this has not been a very easy mission. First of all, because we are dealing with big mining companies, big mining multinationals. Uh, 
Glencore from Switzerland, and Drummond from the US. Big companies who, as you can tell, like to dig big holes and have large armies of uh, lawyers who obviously do not like to be connected to grave human rights violations such as we just heard. And these are the numbers. 3,100 killed, 55,000 disappeared, and 240 people who are still missing up until today. So as a result, these companies have not been very cooperative, to put it mildly. Actually, they have been rather aggressive, specifically in the first part of our campaign. Uh, however, there is light at the end of the tunnel, because the last couple of years have seen quite a change for good. And I think this has uh, to do with three important things. Uh, first of all, uh, a, condition a coalition has been formed of victim groups, unions, NGOs, politicians, journalists, and even some champions within energy companies. And this has created quite a lot of pressure on these mining companies. Secondly, we've managed to organize victim groups and give victims a voice. Behind me, you see Mayra Mendes, who is my colleague and my friend. And two years ago, she came to Europe, where she visited seven European countries, attended almost 80 different events, where she told her story, which is the story of her father, Candido Mendes, who was a, um, a worker at the Drummond Mine, the American company, and a unionist, and he was killed by paramilitary. A horrific story, and uh, it is important that it was told on this side of the cold chain, also because it represents many people. A third important factor has been targeted public campaigning. And here you see an example of last year, uh, um, where together with uh, uh, the help of grassroots supporters, we started a campaign which is called Free Amsterdam from Blood Coal, with the aim of convincing Nuon <laughs> that they had to uh, uh, raise their human rights game. And the good news is that they did. And you will hear more about it from Joel soon. There you see jo Joel's boss, who in a national tele television program announced that Joel had to pack his back bags, go to Colombia and investigate the situation on the ground. So coming back to my first point, taking a stand matters. Thank you. There's no question then, I, I gather. Oh, you're right here. Oh my God. No, no, no. Thanks, Joel. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, 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 no. This is for you. Just, uh, oh, no. Keep it okay. Yeah. One question. Um, you know, there are questions from here? No. You know, correct me. You know, maybe I'm so ignorant, but when I got engaged in this program, it was for the first time I heard about, you, about this whole campaign. Was it because of me? Or, I mean, how was the, the PR campaign? How, how did it go, you know? Well, it was you. It was me, okay, Obviously. that's it, okay. No, I, I rest my case, you know, it, it was me. No, it, it has gotten, well, it, it's interesting, uh, yeah. because you, you seem like a person who cares. Yeah. You seem interested in, the, in these things. Yeah. Uh, this has gotten quite a bit of attention. All the major newspapers in the Netherlands have written about it several times. Uh, Newsweer, NOS, CASA. Yeah, CASA. <laughs> Uh, uh, so, on, and also we had a European approach, so there has been a lot of press attention in many European uh, uh, countries. Yeah, okay, thank you. Because CASA is a very big, big, you know, there are people every Saturday, more than a million people I watching so, CASA. Yeah. yeah, okay, thank you very much. So, it, I hate to admit, but it was me. So, <laughs> please. Thank you. Um, I think this is Wouter's slide. I'm just going to wait for mine. Yes. Um, but I already did a bit of the introduction. Uh, I'd just like to start by putting somewhat of a disclaimer. We're talking a lot about coal supply chain responsibility. Uh, coal has been in the energy mix in Europe for about 60, 70 years. And or especially over the last decade, the adverse impact has become abundantly clear thereof. So um, I'm not here to advocate the use of coal uh, in our energy mix. Um, 
Actually, no? Is this better? Okay. Uh, I'm not advocating the use of coal in our energy mix. Actually, Vattenfall is one of the front runners, and we want to um, um, phase out coal, and we want to be climate neutral in 2050. Um, but as long as we have coal in our portfolio, which is not only the Hamburg uh, Centrale, but we also have six more power plants in Germany. So as long as we have those power plants, I feel we have a responsibility in our supply chain. So also there, I feel we need to take our responsibility. So how does our supply chain look like? I think you point it that way. Oh, again? <laughs> I'm going to keep it as this. I, I can do it like this. Um, Colombia uh, accounts for about 14% in our uh, portfolio, with Russia being, uh, being the biggest supplier. Um, so when we look at Colombia, uh, what did we do in Colombia? We did a human rights risk assessment. It's a bit broader than the introduction Baram did. It's not only about the very important topic that uh, Pax uh, raised, but it's more, uh, more about our code of conduct for suppliers. So that includes human rights, uh, labor unions, labor relationships, um, etc. So what does that mean, a human rights risk assessment? What we did, and when I say we, I mean myself and a colleague, we went to Colombia, we went there for three weeks, and we um, had interviews with about 50 stakeholders. Um, oh, 50 government representatives, we visited communities, we talked to the mining companies, uh, labor unions, etc. Um, and part of that program was observed by PACS, other civil society organizations, and a member of the Green Party uh, here in Amsterdam. Um, I don't have the time to go into a lot of detail, but there are two things which I want to raise, which are our general impressions. Uh, the first one being that there's a complete lack of trust between all stakeholders. I'll, I'll, give, you, I'll give you an example in a minute. Uh, the second one, that it's a very complex uh, situation in Colombia, with the peace process going, the historical uh, uh, armed conflict that has happened in Colombia. Um, and thirdly, there's another one, sorry, is uh, there's no agreed impact of mining in Colombia on, on society. Um, one example which I want to raise is healthcare for mining employees, for example. Mining companies hire doctors uh, to, take a, to look after the health of the mining employees, um, which in fact is very good. But when you talk to the labor unions, they say, look, we don't really trust these doctors because they are not independent and when there is a long-term impact on uh, on a minor for example respiratory issues these doctors never say this is due to uh, work that you're doing so um, and that's definitely a sentiment I can get into uh, looking into the complex situation in Colombia however what's the alternative the alternative are the doctors in town and these are doctors which have been fired uh, for taking bribes for mining employees uh, because these mining employees don't want to go to work, they want to uh, they take up another job as a taxi driver, and that's not because mining pays uh, uh, does not pay well in the, in that region. It, it really pays well. Um, I'm not saying who's right and who's wrong uh, in this debate. I'm saying that it's a complex situation. We need to look at this very carefully. And unfortunately, this is true for all the topics that we look into, including the one raised by uh, raised by Pax. Uh, so that's why we went there, that's why we issued a report. The report identifies the human rights risks that we look into. Uh, it lists the opinions of the different stakeholders on those human rights risks and includes recommendations for the mining companies. That last one is where we're uh, going to focus our next steps, which is going to be to talk with the mining companies in a constructive dialogue to go forward. Um, we feel that it's such a complex situation and us being a Swedish state-owned company, we do not have the position to say, or the, or the knowledge therefore, to say, look, this is where you want to go in the future, this is what you want to do. So we need to take small steps towards an end goal. For example, uh, uh, the issue raised by Pax is something we definitely support, reconciliation for those victims mentioned. It's horrible what happened, of course we support that, but we need to take small and concrete steps towards that goal, and that's where our report uh, uh, comes in. Um, we feel as long as positive steps are being taken, we don't support a boycott of Colombian coal, uh, stop on Colombian coal. We would much rather use the leverage that we have uh, towards improvement. Uh, and by finalizing, I often get asked the question, are you doing enough? I would argue that we are doing what we can at the moment, and that's not to say that we don't have a very long road ahead of us, but we need to acknowledge that as well, that this will be a long road ahead of us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, George. Just one question for now. Uh, you were talking about the lack of trust. How did you win 
uh, their trust when you were there, talking with all the different parties. What was your, uh, I wouldn't say trick, but what was your, uh, um, yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Well, I won't reveal my trick. Uh, <laughs> no, but what I did, the lack of trust is, is towards each other. Uh, especially uh -huh. when, when it comes to the uh, communities, we went there. Uh, there's a there's a fatigue there. They talk to a stakeholder like me every month, That's and true. nothing happens afterwards. So what we what we want to do that's why we're going back to Colombia uh, late March, early April to talk to those communities uh -huh. again to see. Look, this is what we did last time. This is what we talked to you about, and this is uh, where we are right now, and this is how we're going to move forward. So we hope to break that trust and build bridges to, between the local stakeholders because they are the one who should tackle the situations in the country. Okay. Thank you very much, John. Thank you. So, Patricia, you can take it. Yes. I can get this to work. All right. Great. Uh, we work on several issues uh, regarding raw materials that go into our everyday products, namely electronics and clothing. And the issue I'll talk to you all about today briefly is what's happening in Uzbekistan. Uh, for the last several decades, uh, up to a million children were being sent to the cotton fields in Uzbekistan to pick cotton every fall for up to three months. Uh, and this is something that uh, many brands as well as consumers have no idea of whatsoever. Back in uh, 2006, 2007, several reports started coming out. Uh, letting everybody know and having videos of school buses going off to the cotton fields uh, with all these children in them. And uh, due to that, when I st started first finding out about it in 2007, and uh, as uh, Responsible Sourcing Network is a project of As You Sow, and As You Sow works with sustainable, responsible, and impact investors. And so using my connections uh, with a lot of different investor groups that we talked to in the United States, we reached out to a number of brands in both the US and Europe to educate them on what was going on and bringing them together, the brands, the investors, as well as the human rights groups, to say that this is really not, uh, not acceptable. And we got together and we created the Cotton Campaign to talk about how can we all leverage our variety of, um, of power that we each have. We talked to the ambassador of Uzbekistan to the United States. We had a number of big brands in the room, Walmart and Levi's and Gap, to say this is not acceptable. Uh, through trade agreements and conversations, through um, putting pressure on them uh, through companies. and so. What we did was we encouraged companies to make a pledge to not source Uzbek cotton and to make sure that all of their suppliers knew that they should not use Uzbek cotton at all. Now brands, the, all the companies that we know and the brands that are on our clothes, uh, they don't buy cotton. They typically don't even buy fabric or yarn. And so you have to work through the whole supply chain being able to understand uh, what's going on. And Uzbekistan is not the only country. As you can see here, the U.S. Department of Labor labels nine countries as having cotton industries that use some sort of forced labor and 17 countries for, for child labor. And forced labor is a combination of uh, bonded labor, uh, it could be um, being held against your will, other types of exploitation through uh, labor brokers where the costs are really high to get a job. So the whole concept of, of slave labor is, uh, you know, there's quite a variety out there. Unfortunately, there's um, somewhere around 25 million people who are working in forced labor situation today, uh, and that's uh, forced labor. So it's anything that um, could be involved or related to us and our products. We see the highest volume in raw materials, so in the mining, in the harvesting of those raw materials. When we did further research with the companies to find out what were they doing to make sure they don't have slave labor in their product, namely through their cotton sourcing, 80% uh, weren't doing any type of auditing of those cotton yarn spinners, the ones who actually buy cotton. And we saw this actually then as an opportunity, saying it's the yarn spinners that need to be educated and um, taught as to where that risk is 
you know, where that uh, forced, the, where the forced labor is in the cotton industry, and are they buying from there, and what can you do about it? And fortunately, I was just in Paris last or earlier this week. Um, they put out a due diligence guidance on how to address uh, responsible supply chains and how to go through it. And a lot of it is a lot of what uh, Vanderfall just talked about. First, identifying where you have risk in your supply chain. Um, and you could do that through those risk assessments as he was talking about. Also having policies and management systems uh, to do this type of analysis and have it then relate back to your procurement or your sourcing teams. You want to seize, prevent, or mitigate that type of risk. Um, and that's putting in place then through your supply chain what the expectations and requirements are. Then you want to track and verify that all your suppliers are abiding by your commitment and those policies that you have. As well as then you want to communicate, report, and remediate, again, which is really great to hear of a company that's saying, yes, we had this responsibility or this was you know, we're related to this impact, how can we address the issue and solve it? So after that, um, so what we're doing, this new project, yes, that, uh, that was just mentioned, is going to educate those spinners. It's something that I'm currently in the process of setting up right now and verifying, um, auditing those spinners as to where they're getting their cotton. If it's coming from a high-risk region, um, what kind of assurance is it? Better cotton, fair trade, you know, some sort of ethical component that ensures that that cotton is not harvested with forced labor. I know that this is a lot uh, this whole weekend, looking at what consumers can do. I know we'll have more education on that. So I do have a couple of sites here that you could reference to know more about your own product and your own clothing and whether or not those companies are uh, actually taking responsibility and paying attention to what's happening with those raw materials. And I think with that, not working. It was just my email, but we have a, uh, yeah, have it's my, coming. my Twitter. Okay. It's coming, yeah. There it is, great. Thank okay. you so much. Thank you very much, Patricia. Oh, you mean? Okay. Um, just one question. When you were talking about uh, not buying you as companies, you're not buying um, cotton from Uzbekistan. And, but correct me if I'm wrong. Is all the cotton made in Uzbekistan, one way or another, involving child labor? Did you make any distinction between good cotton and bad cotton, or just saying no cotton? I'd say uh, in most countries, there's a combination of cotton that's harvested with good and bad practices. Yeah. Unfortunately, in Uzbekistan and Turkmenistan, where the governments are controlling the entire cotton industries, it's government-orchestrated forced labor. So okay. I would say today, all the cotton coming from Uzbekistan and Turkmenistan is exploited slave cotton. Cool. Thank you very much. Thank you. OK. Uh, yeah, please put it over there. Yes, Daniel. It's your time, and your five minutes are starting. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think it's going to be uh, five minutes. Um, I'm uh, Daniel. I am the co-founder of Unrecorded. Um, together with my partner, Yola, uh, we met a year and a half ago, uh, and we had a lot of discussions about um, um, how different industries changed over time, often became better over time. Um, I think more efficient, uh, then again more sustainable, um, and often also more social. Um, my partner comes from the oil industry, so there was a lot of discussions uh, going on about that. Uh, and I have a background in fashion, um, which is also not the best industry at the moment. So um, we talked about how we could add value to the space that we were in, uh, clothing. Um, so we uh, decided to set up a brand um, mainly focusing on high quality basics uh, and using sustainable materials um, and trying to be more efficient by selling directly to our customers. Um, yeah, and that's uh, what we do. Okay, then it gives me and, and also, yeah, maybe if people have questions, uh, I yeah. think uh, then I can uh, so, explain a bit more. We have a room, uh, just uh, maybe five minutes, you know, to ask you some additional questions, you know, like what, when, how, you know. First of all, you know, um, when Patricia talked about, you know, this cotton from the other countries, when did you hear about, you know, 
bad cotton, to put it that way, you know? Have you heard about this before? Um, I've heard about it um, a long time before. My dad uh, used to be in uh, second-hand clothing, um, traveling the world buying clothes. So I already knew that there's a lot of sort of uh, child labor going on in uh, cotton production yeah. uh, and cotton sourcing. Yeah. And then when I moved into fashion, um, I think that was about 15 years ago, um, I also did a lot of work for Kuyuchi, which is a brand also focusing on uh, organic clothing. Yeah, it's a Dutch brand, am I right? It's a Dutch brand, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so, so you knew this issue. The other question is, you know, in a way, you know, you broke, you know, you quit the normal uh, chain of producing of um, uh, fashion, you know, about four times a year, am I right? Yeah, you know, like every season you, uh, there is a new, uh, new fashion, you know, you stop that in a way, in one way or another, you are going to do, you know, like things that go maybe two or three years along without taking notice of any fashion. I, I'm trying to make a question, you know, but uh, um, you understand yeah. what I mean? So, you know? so what we do is we focus on <laughs> basics, which is yeah. t-shirts and sweatshirts. So to be honest, um, uh, the fashion seasons or the trends don't really apply to basics. So for us, it doesn't make any sense to sort of uh, apply to them rules, those yeah. rules. Yeah. And how, this, how does your uh, initiative, your, your action, how, how do other people, you know, let's say your colleagues, how do they see you? Do you have any idea what their reaction, their, their reply is? Um, I still have a lot of people, I know a lot of people uh, and I have a lot of friends who still work in a certain industry where they don't have any focus on sustainable production. Um, and they all th actually say it's needed um, and they support it. Yeah. Um, but often they are not the people who are in charge of really steering a company or bigger companies into a different direction. So are you saying that it's the responsibility of the bigger companies? Are you implying that? Um, I think the, the responsibilities with all of us, it starts with demand and consumers. I think uh, when they become more aware and start asking questions, I think brands will make a change. Okay. Uh, but for sure, I think bigger brands, it's easier for them to, uh, yeah. you would think it's easier for them to uh, make impact than uh, small brands. Yeah. By the way, what you said you know, would, would be one of the uh, topics we'll talk about during the uh, conversation because you said it starts with the consumer and demand. I know it, it sounds you know, very um, solid, but maybe you can just turn it around. Maybe it starts with the companies. When, they, when they, they show me you know, what there are possibilities there are, maybe I can um, go with them. But that, as I said, we will talk about that later. It's very important for you, and especially for uh, Joel later on. Thank you very much, Daniel. Thank you. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry, Daniel, wait, wait, wait one second. You know, do we have a question over there? Okay, hey, Kadimik, yeah, can you under me for back? Sorry, uh, I'm going to. No, 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 I held. No, 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 I held the microphone. No, please. What's your name and why? What's your question? My name is Gert Jan van Dobbele. Yeah. I have a simple question. Yeah. I do not understand what you do. Can you tell me what you do? Oh, uh, yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, One more time. Ladies, so, so we're a clothing brand and we sell clothes uh, made from sustainable materials. Um, does that answer your question? All kinds of clothes? No, it's basic. So it's, it's mainly the garments uh, that everybody wears. So t-shirts, sweatshirts, uh, shirts you're wearing yourself at the moment. Yeah. So we don't yeah. really focus on like the fashion trends. I think, you know, that's something that um, other people are better at. Yeah. Um, you sell them as well? We design them, we manufacture them and we sell them. So we... we um, consumers, so we don't do uh, B two B two B, so it's only B two C. So we sell online and uh, have our own store. Okay, thank you, Daniel. Sorry if that okay. wasn't really clear. <laughs> no, yeah, okay. So. Mira, it's you. Oh, just one question. Wait, wait, wait. Yes, sure. I come first, please. Hi, uh, maybe a tricky question, but I wonder what are you wearing today on yourself? Is yeah. it all sustainably sourced or? The, are you more selective in this? Okay, cool. <laughs> yes, Daniel. So, we start with uh, the upper. Yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> this one, Daniel. So, good. 
No. No, I'm going to do that. No, because it was my question. I'm glad that you are asking it. So now I can. So this one. Where is it so, from? so actually, first of all, good question because um, it sort of. Um, so I wear my own uh, clothing often, um, but I grew up um, with my dad having secondhand clothes shops. So we only wore secondhand clothes. So that's where sort of my focus on quality comes from. Where I try to buy things that last long. So. This jeans is not organic cotton. Um, it's manufactured in China um, by a brand that I actually really like because they're very creative. So I also like to support brands who are creative. Um, but I wash this twice a year and I've been wearing it for four years. So it's actually, I try to, when I buy things that are not sustainable, then again, uh, organable, I try to, uh, organic, I try to buy things that last. Yeah, how about the shoes? The shoes are uh, second. Are they made for walking? They are made for walking. <laughs> They're second, ha second hand, actually, uh, from Mark Platz. Oh, yeah. okay. um, and I always wanted them because I really like the designer. And they're re very expensive, and I bought them very cheap, which is quite nice. Cool. And I, I guess I can link you up when, you know, when it comes to other stuff, you know, like the <laughs> undergarment, yeah? OK, cool. Thank you very much. Thank you, Daniel. OK. Uh, Mira, you are going to use that one? Okay. I just give this to you for later, yes? OK. Shift gears. In the microphone, please. Is, yes. it, is it on? Yes. Hello. Yeah. Can you hear me? Good. Um, we're going to shift gears a little bit because we've been uh, focusing specifically on particular companies um, or, or issues related to those companies. And I'm going to now talk a bit about Kazakhstan uh, and labor rights uh, violations that we've documented there. I imagine that for most of you in the room, uh, Kazakhstan is little known or unknown and quite far off. Um, and has little tangible connection to your everyday lives. And in fact, I'm not here to dispute that today. Um, <laughs> Kazakhstan is far off. Uh, it's situated between, Kazakh, uh, excuse me, situated between China and Russia and the rest of the Central Asian countries. It's a huge landmass. We'll have a picture of the, of the country up on a map uh, shortly um, in a moment. Uh, so you'll see how large a country it is uh, with only a population of 18 million. Um, something else you might not know about Kazakhstan is that the Netherlands is the number one uh, foreign direct investor in Kazakhstan, uh, both in terms of input and output. Um, they, the Netherlands and Kazakhstan have had uh, diplomatic relations for 25 years, basically since the time that Kazakhstan has been an independent country. Um, and there are about 900 uh, companies with Dutch capital uh, operating in Kazakhstan at the moment, according to the Kazakh uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Um, so even though Kazakhstan seems remote, um, I'm here to challenge you today that um, as a Dutch citizen, uh, you do have the opportunity to potentially help affect or address the human rights situation in Kazakhstan. Um, and in particular because of the close uh, economic relationship and diplomatic relationship that the Netherlands shares with, with Kazakhstan. So we're going to watch a short video um, and then I will continue uh, talking a bit more about our research uh, and findings in Kazakhstan. Kazakhstan. Advanced. Rich. Kazakhstan's economy is fueled by large reserves of natural resources like oil and gas. But despite significant economic development over the last decade, Kazakhstan has long been a country of quiet repression. The government has strict controls over freedom of speech and freedom of assembly, and now it has tightened controls over trade unions as well. In 2011, strikes by oil workers in western Kazakhstan ended in a violent crackdown. The police opened fire on workers and others, killing at least 12 people. The new laws in Kazakhstan have created obstacles for worker organizing, restrictions on collective bargaining, and have made it difficult for workers to protect their rights by going on strike. С принятием нового закона о профсоюзах, естественно, очень сильно изменилась деятельность профсоюзов. То есть профсоюзы, которые существовали самостоятельно, не могли уже существовать так. Им необходимо было пройти перерегистрацию. 
получить новый статус. Соответственно, наша организация, которая существовала, объединяла самостоятельные профсоюзы независимые, не смогла пройти перерегистрацию. Ни один наш профсоюз не получил регистрацию внесения изменений, дополнения своих уставов. Соответственно, мы были парализованы. Trade union leaders in Kazakhstan face harassment and surveillance by government officials or by law enforcement. They can also face retaliatory action on the part of companies that employ them. Соответственно, многие наши лидеры испытывают очень большие давления, не могут работать и принимать определенные решения, потому что над ними постоянно присутствует вот участие наших органов. В частности, я на себе это испытываю очень сильно. Это выматывает, действует на нервную систему. Ты чувствуешь, что сопровождение бесконечное. Trade unions are the only organizations that can effectively defend and protect workers' interests in the workplace. The International Labor Organization has repeatedly called on Kazakhstan to amend its restrictive legislation. Kazakhstan's key economic partners, like the European Union or the United States, should call on Kazakhstan to take immediate steps to allow workers to organize freely. I should have said the Netherlands um, um, as one of the key economic partners. Um, so this uh, video clip accompanied the publication of this report uh, in November 2016, uh, in which we document uh, the, the situation for trade unions uh, in Kazakhstan and the new trade union law and its effects and the difficulties that trade unions had in complying with the new legislation. Um, we, as I mentioned in the video, we also documented uh, cases of harassment and surveillance um, and even some dismissals of workers and, and uh, worker activists uh, for their activism, um, and as well as the difficulties in informing unions and um, uh, bargaining collectively. Um, I regret to say that since the publication of that report, the situation has only further deteriorated. Um, the largest independent trade union in Kazakhstan was shut down. Uh, several uh, Two uh, trade union leaders are sitting in prison right now. Larissa Harkova, who you saw in the video, um, was, uh, was faced with uh, politically motivated uh, criminal uh, charges of embezzlement and uh, the court, although they didn't imprison her um, as a result of that, those proceedings, uh, she now faces a five-year ban on any trade uh, or leadership position in a trade union. So the authorities in Kazakhstan have sent a very clear message that independent organizing will not be tolerated. Um, and while the focus of our work in Kazakhstan was very much on the rights violating practices um, and policies of the Kazakh government, um, companies as well uh, are, uh, have human rights obligations under international human rights law. Uh, the United Nation uh, Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights, which we've heard several of the other speakers mention uh, without naming it by name. Um, this is a standard that was endorsed by the UN um, and is widely accepted as the authoritative standard that businesses need to follow. Uh, require that companies should respect human rights, um, that they should exercise due diligence uh, and identify human rights risks, which we also heard about um, in practice, that uh, companies should avoid complicity and abuses and ensure that any violations that occur in spite of those efforts taken, um, there's uh, adequate uh, response to them. So companies operating in countries like Kazakhstan that have a bad environment, um, still uh, they can't hide behind those bad laws and practice. Like any other businesses in Kazakhstan, the Dutch uh, companies there must ensure that they uphold rights in their business practices or be even proactive uh, about upholding rights beyond what is uh, established in law in Kazakhstan. And furthermore, you, to come back to my initial point, um, as Dutch citizens, um, can engage with your democratically elected government and members of parliament to ask them about their relationship with the Kazakhstan government. When the trade minister of the Netherlands visits Kazakhstan, um, you can inquire about whether human rights were raised or violations of human rights or labor rights were raised. Uh, raised excuse me. Um, he incidentally visited Kazakhstan uh, last year. And the, the thinking is that if you and if organizations like Human Rights Watch start to ask questions about uh, the role of the Dutch government with, in their relationship with Kazakhstan, then Kazakhstan might be persuaded in the long run to think that um, upholding human rights in their, in their practices and their labor rights in, in the country is in their own interests, and that might have the effect then of ensuring that uh, there are less abuses. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mira. <laughs> Just one question for you, Mira. 
uh, and then we start the, the panel discussion. Um, as you said, you know, the situation in Kazakhstan is quite harsh for, um, uh, for people who are um, um, having critics on, on their uh, policy. Um, may I ask about your situation? Uh, are you, you, I mean, as a member of Human Rights uh, uh, Watch, are you allowed to go there? How do you work there? How, how is this uh, uh, labor situation for you? Um, Please, I in the microphone, yeah, take it to your, take it to, you know, use your microphone, use the other one, I, I will take it, this give it to you. <laughs> yeah, no, if Mohammed comes, don't come to the uh, yes, mountain. mountain yes, mountain. yes. Mountain. yeah, 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 okay. Um, so it's not the case across Central Asia that Human Rights Watch has access, um, but I am happy to share with you that in Kazakhstan I've not faced any difficulties getting into the country, but particularly in the context of the research that we did for this report, I was subject to surveillance, as were people that I spoke to, trade union leaders uh, or, or worker activists, um, who were contacted by the, the security services either before or after I talked to them. Um, you know, we have a, a do no harm principle at Human Rights Watch, so we try to mitigate those risks as much as possible to the people. Excuse um, me, would you please, what's the principle? A do no harm principle. Oh, so oh. we, yes, we, we, in, we take measures to ensure that, that the people that share their testimonies with us and information with us do not suffer subsequent uh, harassment or persecution as a result of sharing that information with us. And if any of you were in attendance in the, in the previous session, we talked a bit about that in terms of uh, uh, photographic material and the like. Um, but in this case, uh, the trade union activists that I spoke to were contacted. They're already quite well-known figures in that part of Kazakhstan. So we did follow up with them and we ensured that there were no further issues. Um, but in my case, it, it uh, yeah, we, I just, I had surveillance and it was quite aggressive at times to make sure that I was aware that I was under surveillance um, and in those instances we have to make a decision about whether we can ensure the conditions for doing the research in a way that uh, would allow for confidentiality if that's the the choice of the people that we're talking to so that's the okay. Kazakhstan context thank you thank you so as I said you know I will start the conversation what about maybe 10 minutes uh, I have a couple of questions for them and after that, I would like to see some hands in the air because uh, then you can ask some questions Joel May I ask uh, you the first question? You know, uh, is the um, respecting um, human rights is it an official issue in your company? Are there any lines, any sentences, any rules which refers to human rights? Uh, yes, there are. Um, I mean, being a Swedish state-owned company, obviously, we have additional obligations than being a public, uh, a non-public company, a listed company. Um, so we need to adhere to Swedish law. Uh, Sweden is an OECD country, which means we uh, adhere by the OECD guidelines. But I think what's even more important, rather than the guidelines of a, of a company, is uh, the external pressure to get companies moving into that direction. And that's where uh, I think Pax played a uh, played a good role in getting this topic on the agenda. That's yeah. uh, that's not to say there wasn't internal discussion on this topic yet, but it needs NGOs such as Pax. It needs governments to get this higher on the agenda internally and get the attention from higher management. So I would argue that's even more important than than setting up a rather vague framework on on what should be done on yeah. human rights. Of course, I can understand you. You will stress that that it's. It's more important that other people will uh, warn you about that. But since you are actually over there, you are there. Your people are there in Colombia. Was it the first well, time well, that, that you heard about them talking to you about the violation of human rights? Why not? don't you uh, start the action? We, we are not in Colombia. It's our supply chain. Okay, so it's it's not it's not our our operations, yeah. but I think that's uh, uh, that's the first thing I should okay. mention. Thank um, you. I think uh, when I got involved, this was definitely a new topic for me. Uh, this all started in 2010 with two network uh, uh, broadcasts in the in the Netherlands, yeah. and for me at the time it was a very very new uh, topic. Yeah. Uh, so. In that regard, yes, I was, I was not aware of that situation, yeah. and um, civil society helped put that on the agenda. Okay, Walter. Well, yeah, that's probably the, the, the main thing we've learned, and I think it's a more general lesson, uh, is that pressure uh, is essential, because otherwise change is not going to happen. Uh, and even though progress has been made, it is still crucial, uh, because First of all, uh, Nuon has taken uh, a good move, and we've applauded that uh, uh, as well, also publicly. 
uh, uh, but we're not there yet. Uh, uh, and uh, we have to, first of all, put pressure on other energy companies, such as Ascent, NG, and Uniper, who are not as far as, uh, as Nuon, but are also big players in the coal supply chain. And to be honest, to my neighbor, also we have to, uh, uh, we have to keep on watching what's going on. Nuon has said very clearly, we want a reconciliation dialogue between mining companies and victims. And they are and traveling they have said, in March, so and, that's good. And they have said, which, which I think is also crucial, if concrete steps are not taken, we can suspend our trade. Because without a stick, these mining companies do not understand the language you're talking. So let me get it clear. So you are saying if the situation will not improve or the, the, the violation goes on, you will stop taking co uh, working with them. Am I yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. We, cool. we said based on our recommendations, we will develop cool. an action plan. If yeah. that's not being followed, we'll, incre uh, we'll, um, yeah. we'll stop our, suspend our relationship, as it's called, yeah. until uh, the situation has improved. Yeah. Uh, Patricia, when, they were t when uh, Walter said you know, about pressure, I saw you and Mira, you were nodding. Yeah, yeah, pressure. <laughs> what, what, why? Yeah, yeah, I just, yeah. So what, what, what's your take on that? Well, I mentioned investors, and the pressure that we put on companies is a lot of it is through investors. For example, we've just filed a shareholder resolution with Monster Beverage uh, due to what we see as a very high risk of slave labor in their sugar supply chain. So in the U.S., it's usually a little, uh, the bar is lower to be able to file a shareholder resolution, but there's a lot of investor engagement that happens here. But I'd also say consumers. Uh, I think it's easier with the brands that we all know, if they're electronics or, or clothing brands, yeah. uh, to put pressure on them. If you want to boycott and uh, protest in front of their stores, send lots of tweets. And I mean, social media has opened up a whole new avenue. Uh, but the B2B or some of the other companies, I mean, because the companies doing the abuse are typically not actually the brands that we have relationships with. So that's why you have to work through the supply chain to find out really who's linked to doing the abusing. So, uh, if you, you know, um, you know, because I can understand that you, you know, as your NGO or, or Mira, you, you know, you have uh, like a limited, you know, um, how do you call it, resources, you know. Sure. If you can put uh, the, your resources, would you put it on the consumer pressure or put it on the um, government, politicians, or the business people? Uh, well, I had that one slide for Uzbekistan when it was the government doing the abusing that you want to try to put the pressure on in multiple places simultaneously. And I think that's what really has worked in Uzbekistan because what I ran out of time to say is that they've taken the youngest children out of the fields. They're not sending them to the, to the cotton fields anymore. Unfortunately, they're now sending more adults, their parents or teachers, nurses, yeah. uh, university students. But uh, we're keeping up the pressure, but uh, I think all of it needs to happen, and I don't know if Mira has uh, more to add to that. Uh, Mira, please. Yeah, um, I would just say that, of course, in terms of uh, ending human rights abuses, the primary target of our advocacy is going to be the government where those abuses are being perpetrated. But the government in question may not always meet with us. Um, and if we take the Kazakhstan example, when we published this report, um, we didn't get meetings with the government. We didn't get a response from the, the ministries that we approached. And in those instances, then you have to use other measures to put pressure on. You have to resort to the international media. You want to uh, meet with, with partner governments of Kazakhstan to get these issues on their radar so that they can be putting pressure on, on Kazakhstan, for example. Um, so it, I think we all use a range of different tactics to try to maximize uh, the information that's out there about the abuses because the, the bottom line is that once that information is known, it's a lot easier to put pressure on a company or a government in question to stop those abuses. Okay. I'm through my uh, questions, so please raise your hand. And Yip, would you please, uh, yes, over here, yes, yes, please. Thank you. She has the microphone, yes, please. I have a question for, uh, for Daniel. Uh, Patricia told us a lot about the nature of the supply chain and how you verify, and we also heard uh, from Joelle about the stakeholder conversations that they were having. Um, and I didn't get a sense from you about uh, how Unrecorded actually knows that your clothes are sustainable. How do you cool. verify your supply chain? What is your, yeah. who are your suppliers? Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, 
Um, yeah, good question. Um, so I think that the most important thing is that you get involved with every uh, step of the supply chain. Um, so what we don't do, but what we should be doing actually, um, is also see exactly where our cotton comes from. Um, at the moment, we only use uh, organic cotton, which is certified by GOTS, which is a global organic textile standard. Um, so that sort of makes sure that we get cotton from certain countries that don't use um, child labor, for example. Um, so it's not only the social criteria that are important to us, but also the, the um, uh, environmental uh, standards should be uh, good. Cool. Patricia, so, I yeah. thought you would, you would like to add something. <laughs> I would, only because an organic standard uh, addresses soil and environmental impact. It actually doesn't have social uh, requirements at the cotton field. GOTS does verify decent work conditions per ILO standards at mm -hmm. the at the uh, spinning and mm -hmm. uh, weaving or knitting uh, textile factories, but not at the farm. And so uh, um, we'll have to have a conversation afterwards in regards to <laughs> no, uh, we, we need this more. No, have conversation right you know, now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You, are, you are in a safe environment. No. Talk, it's well, and, I mean, it is a, it's a big concern of mine that organic doesn't address social yeah. at, at field. That's why on a lot of coffee or, or yeah. uh, chocolate bars, it, you have both labels. You have to have the fair trade label and the... Uh, or, uh, organic bio label, I you know, see. because it it doesn't address uh, labor conditions in the field. To be honest, I didn't know that. I just assume, pre-assume, when it's organic, you know, there are kind of you know leftish, high-educated people like me, so they care about human conditions of workers as well. But it's not like that. No, it's not. It's okay. Have yeah. that clear. Okay. Uh, you have a question, please, yes. Hi, this question is for Joel. Uh, can you tell us if you've, uh, with the mining company, set any specific timelines for the stick? Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah, I yeah. yeah, understand. Um, the report as it is right now includes the report as it is right now includes recommendations for the company, so those are pretty vague. Uh, I also mentioned we're going back to Colombia. That's why we're going to move from those recommendations into hard action plans, and those action plans will be uh, not only action plans, but those will be requirements. We're expecting the mining company companies to live up to the actions in the action plan. Um, so that's a process we are going through right now, um, but that will definitely be in place. In regards to a timeline, there's a difference between the matter in which different mining companies want to cooperate uh, um, but uh, we hope to speak to the all four of them in this case in uh, March April it, it means it, it's a no am I right yeah no. that's a no they, they have no timeline for that yeah so the, the follow-up to that is would you then have a shorter timeline for the companies not cooperating because it almost sounds like it's the other way around that the ones that are not cooperating you're giving them more time to cooperate but it seems like it'd actually be more effective to give them a shorter timeline. At, at the moment, we, we haven't set a timeline because we haven't discussed the recommendations in our report with them. So we don't have any action plans in place that we say, look, you need to adhere to, to, to this action. We haven't done that yet. That's in the next phase. So I only know by the time I talk to the mining companies what timeline we are talking about. The only timeline, timeline I can give you right now is that we're going to Colombia in March, April. Okay, I, I, I can see her face. She's not really quite happy with this answer, you know. <laughs> I can tell you. Uh, you had a question. Oh, but Walter, would you like to add something? Uh, no, just the fact that, and, and, but I think that's very clear also from your, from your very good question, is that a uh, concrete timeline is essential. Uh, but I think also Nguyen and Joel are, are, are aware of that. Second point is, is interesting because we do see, as Joel also indicated, a difference between the two big mining companies. One of them uh, has opened up and has recently uh, attended a commemoration of a, of a massacre that took place about 20 years ago in their zone of influence. So also at the Colombian level, we do see a differentiation between companies which is also very important for organizations like us to be able to differentiate and uh, use that uh, uh, between companies as well. Okay. Um, yep, and then we'll come to you. And there was a lady over Yes, you. Please. Um, ask. I have two questions. Yeah. Um, the first one is to Joel. Um, so you were talking about credibility. How much 
did you consider the idea of having a third party assessing human rights when it comes to coal mining? I mean, we are at an event which is organized by Human Rights Watch. Maybe Mira can think about assessing <laughs> in an objective way. This is the first okay, question. yeah, I can answer yeah. that one. Yeah. Uh, well, besides this specific uh, human rights risk assessment uh, uh, that we did, uh, I mean, and that was observed by civil society organizations, so in that way it wasn't just us uh, behind closed doors talking to, uh, uh, talking to other stakeholders. That was observed, and uh, I wouldn't call that a verification, but at least it wasn't just us talking to the stakeholders. On top of that, we also uh, are one of the founders of an industry initiative called Better Coal, which conducts independent site assessments. So Better Coal is an organization which hires auditors, which then goes to the site and, um, um, and audits that mining company based on a code of conduct. Um, that exercise is very much looked at from a mining company perspective so what are the risks the mining company faces what we try to do is look at it uh, rather from a from a rights holder perspective from a community perspective from the perspective of a labor union what are the right uh, the the risks that you face and we hope that those those two meet in the middle so the independence and the credibility would for those uh, assessments uh, would lie with uh, better call oh by, by the way who is uh, paying better call What's what's the uh, what's this better call? Uh, utilities. Uh, it it started in somewhere around 2011. Has about 60 members and includes all the large uh, uh, European utilities. And it is funded by the utilities. So it is not funded by the mining companies. So or energy companies. Are uh, what? Are energy companies. Yeah, sorry. Are energy yeah, companies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I keep utilities, saying utilities. You know, yeah, like yeah. yeah. It's energy. So in terms companies. of in, independent, <laughs> uh, uh, we, we have we we've, we've been very clear. We don't consider this to be the best instrument. And well, I know when that someone say, uh, of your position when say we don't consider it as the best instrument, <laughs> you mean by that we don't trust them at all. Well, there's, uh, up until, about, up until uh, now, uh, they have not given, given us m much reason to be very <laughs> enthu enthusiastic about it. But Why not? In influencing things, uh, first of all, because they have indicated themselves for years that when it comes to the severe human rights uh, violations, yeah. they are not the proper uh, uh, instrument to address it. Yeah. We do see a little bit of change. Um, yeah. It's going very slow because, as you well mentioned, there are many energy, energy companies yeah. there, also okay. very slow ones. Yeah. Uh, um, at the moment, they improve to a level where we say this is going to make a difference, then we're pragmatic and say, okay, use this pressure to make sure those mining companies are going to do what they have to do, yeah. compensate victims. Okay, okay. Um, you had another question, but maybe it's, it's better to ask this guy and then you, you know, otherwise it's your show, you know? Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> yeah, please, ask um, A question to uh, Joel. Um, so basically... I'm popular. Uh... <laughs> yeah, you know, that's the thing, you know, when we have... You, know, you open up once and there you go. <laughs> yeah, yes, yes, yes. I think we, we probably talked about this uh, a little bit. Uh, you mentioned that there are guidelines, but obviously those guidelines, OECD guidelines, for example, didn't really work effectively, otherwise we wouldn't have these uh, issues in the first place. So basically it looks like the main thing is the pressure that the organization, different organizations are bringing that uh, um, um, I'd say force, between brackets, force companies yeah. to change their behavior. Do you think that without that pressure we would ever have uh, a situation where these, don't, these issues don't happen uh, at the first place? I mean, a company... No, you ask a question. No. Don't answer your own okay. question. Okay, <laughs> so about the importance of pressure because the guidelines, you know, as they say, you know, if you look at, you know, uh, constitution of Iranian government, one of the best in the country, in, in the world, you know? So it's not about the guide, like guidelines, it's about how the practical <laughs> stuff, daily, uh, daily basis. Yep. Um, in a way, I think Wouter already answered that question. Uh, mining companies are going to move once they feel the financial impact. Uh, they don't care that much about uh, us being a Swedish state-owned company, us, Sweden, being an OECD country. They don't really care. They say, look, do you want to differentiate yourself? You want to do the right thing? Okay, that means uh, I'm going to be a preferred supplier, uh, for example. If one of those, if we're going to say, out of four mining companies, two don't live up to our recommendations, we don't going to buy from you anymore. That means strong signal, which is going to hurt their pockets, and that's uh, when these companies are going to listen. Okay. 
But she, I, I thought you would like to add something to it, you know? It's true. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and I, I mentioned that you need a variety of strategies, yeah. but I can say that the uh, pledge that we started that now has over 275 uh, brands have signed on to it saying they won't source Uzbek cotton, that has made a big difference. Yeah. The ILO told us that the pledge made a difference. We know brands have received letters from the, their Uzbek ambassadors saying, please take your name off the pledge. And I've had uh, the IFC is doing a new project in Uzbekistan now on cotton saying, well, what's it going to take for you to, to end the pledge? You know, because we're making all these improvements. But yeah. it is our, our pressure, and we know that the government cares, both yeah. from a reputation perspective as well as uh, it's hitting them in the pocketbook, that it's more difficult for them to sell their cotton today yeah. than it was before. Yeah. And so now they're willing to change. And just to um, be sure, you know, the, when you are talking about the companies 275, are we still talking about the Walmarts and the, the big companies? It's, it, I've, um, it's a lot of big companies, yeah. right, that we first engage from the investor perspective. But now I have, I'm, I'm starting to have textile mills uh, write to me and say, hey, we want to put our name on the pledge. We're not sourcing any Uzbek cotton. So it's starting to trickle down the, yeah. the supply chain. And probably soon Daniel will be 276. Yeah, I'd like to actually uh, <laughs> yeah. invite, right, Daniel, them, invite them to sign to, our pledge. Are we going to make the deal here on stage? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> are you going to really, I mean, it's a question, you know, are you going to get in involved in this, get engaged in um, this? Uh, how realistic um, is that? How practical? To be honest, um, I think that if we can improve on any level, then I'm always interested in, yeah. in sourcing better cotton. So it's uh, a yes. I was under the understanding that uh, got certified cotton for sure is not from Uzbekistan. Yeah. Am I correct? Uh, it's true. They don't have organic cotton in Uzbekistan. So in that sense, we're already on the list, but not really okay. with a name. Okay. <laughs> so it'd be easy for you to sign it. <laughs> yeah, no, but, but I think great, that... You um, know, to have you know, Dutch company on record, you know, believe it or not, they were going to be, be big, you know? Yeah. The, the only question uh, I have is, like, with all these big companies signing up, um, they're so big. Uh, what is the percentage of what they do good, and how can they improve? How do you sort of convince these companies to improve even more of what they do because I see really big names and I often wonder with the scale and with the speed and how they produce, yeah. how they can sort of, you know, um, really live up to being one of them 275. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. No, it, it's a good question. Um, and the other thing I was going to say is even though the big companies have signed the pledge, uh, then what are they doing about it to implement it? Yeah. And a lot of them start with sending letters to their suppliers saying don't source cotton because it has to get to those that actually purchase the mm -hmm. cotton. Um, and we weren't sure if, okay, well, do letters to suppliers really work? I mean, we are finding out it's working because things are actually slowly but changing, which is great. Um, and that is also why I'm creating this initiative, yes, is because we actually want to verify that the yarn spinners are not buying Uzbek cotton, but not just Uzbek cotton, uh, Turkmen cotton I mentioned. And then it's going to get a little harder when it comes to China and India, which are the largest producers of cotton in the world, where you have some exploitation there, and other places is there is no exploitation. And so that's where we need to start doing deeper risk analysis within countries to find out where that exploitation happens. But if we, similar to what has been done with conflict minerals, have a public list of the mills that have gone through the verification system, it will encourage more mills to want to join it, as well as then you'll have the Better Cotton Initiative and Fair Trade that will, uh, we need that kind of verification on the ground, um, and we start to pull more demand for the ethical cotton that's being grown, because we'll try to dry up the market for the cotton that is not verified. Yeah. Uh, please uh, keep your, uh, uh, yes, yeah, show your hand so I can uh, send, yep, uh, over here, please. This lady, young lady, yes. Yeah, it is, um, we look at, yeah. First Hi, uh, just two quick questions, if I may. The yeah. first one um, is for Patricia. Just, is there some kind of logo or certification that we as consumers can look out for, but not just for Netherlands cotton worldwide, that uh, is certified to be free of uh, slave labor at the, at the labor level? And then the second question, perhaps for both Patricia um, and Daniel, is, you know, we hear about how, yeah, in, in some ways, consumer, like we as consumers are the ones that have to speak up because of the demand for fast fashion and for the demand for cheap clothing. Um, so I'm just 
like I'd love to know because I'm not from a fashion background, obviously, what kind of profit margin are we talking about if, you know, a lot of our, these high, high street brands were to start um, sourcing their cotton from more ethical, you know, are we, are we talking about, you know, a, a $40 um, sweater going to, you know, $60 or I'm just curious as yeah, a consumer. Cool, yeah. Uh, you definitely should uh, look up uh, his uh, website, you know, uh, unrecorded. But first question first. Yeah, so and you're, you're qu asking if there's a slave-free label for clothing, yes. basically? Yeah, for yeah. cotton. No. <laughs> <laughs> I, would, I would say, actually, I don't know, there's no slave-free label for, uh, well, I was going to say any product, like something that's applied to all products. I know that different individual brands, like if they're only fair trade if they only source fair trade, like Tony's chocolate, uh, on the inside of it, it talks about how they're yeah. you know, against slavery. But um, unfortunately, I really see that a lot of the uh, certifications are for the positive. There's nothing that's actually focused on just eliminating the negative. Right, and so, and it's how smaller brands that are really committed to making sure they have ethical and sustainable products is that they're like, okay, well, if we can control this or there's that certification out there, we'll move towards that. I see it as a whole kind of compendium that you have like the worst over here and the really best over here, but you need kind of steps in between to get there. And what we're trying to do with yes, because if it's conventional machine harvested from Australia, I'm not worried about it. I'm worried about the just the worst of the worst. And if we can get there through the Yes Initiative, at least with cotton, you know, that will start pulling the market away from from the slavery and toward eventually all toward the fair trade and the organic and the, the really great certifications. Yeah. And Daniel, the question for you, you but talk us about a little bit about the margins. Uh. Um, for, for the bigger brands, I cannot really say specifically what the margins are, but I guess for fast fashion, it could be somewhere around buying a t-shirt for one euro and selling it for 15 euros, I guess. Yeah. So it's quite a big margin. And if you would move into um, organic cotton, um, they would still make a killing. Um, but um, it's, it's a small percentage. If you move away from, from non-organic to organic cotton, um, it's 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 a small, small yeah. uh, price increase, which shouldn't really sort of affect the consumer price. Yeah. So in that sense, um, it's a bit of a shame that it's not yeah. happening more. Yeah. As a matter of fact, Daniel, I, I, I uh, uh, went to your website, and you just show, you just demonst demonstrate you know, how your price is uh, built up. Am I right? Yeah, correct. Yeah, could you yeah. please tell us a little bit about you know how you cut the like the, the middleman stuff. Yeah, it's, it's not so much cut out the middleman because I think that's has a, a negative connotation. No, no, correct me. Uh, because <laughs> um, I think words. that you know um, you know everybody should um, make a decent living the way they should or yeah. they do it at, yeah. at the moment. Um, yeah. But I think for us it was mainly uh, my partner has a, a background in packaging and oil industry and these industries they try to sort of over the years. Um, become more efficient. So for us, it was more: how can we be more efficient so we reach, um, or how so we can get a better price point or more affordable price point so we can reach more people. And for us, it was sort of seeing how close can we get to a fast fashion price point so we can also reach these people or these consumers, young consumers, mainly. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, we have only 10 minutes left, so uh, please, Rachel, over there, 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 there. Yes, at the very end, yes. Oh, yeah, don't go away. Yeah. Um, I have a question regarding um, the, there was a lot of talk about the importance of external pressures on companies to get them to change uh, their behavior. Um, and I was wondering um, if maybe some of you could share your reflections on maybe the broader context in which a lot of these uh, companies operate. Because um, I heard the word capital once, um, but I haven't heard any talk about basically the economic system in which most of these companies are operating, which is uh, capitalism. Um, and I think also that it's a system when we're talking about labels or, you know, oh, what clothes should I buy? What products should I buy that are best for, for the environment, for other people? Um, and that this is a system where these companies are basically um, invested exactly in their, in their profits. Um, and that it's also those with more capital that then use their money to try to steer these companies into 
changing their ways and those that are most exploited simply don't have access to that kind of uh, consumer power in that way in this capitalist system. Um, so I'm, I'm basically wondering, um, um, maybe especially for, uh, for Joel um, um, and also for uh, Daniel, um, how, you, how you position your, your uh, business practices in a way that you know, maybe would lead to change not over the next hundred years, because I honestly think it's going to be way uh, too late. Excuse me, excuse me, you know, I guess you've made your point, you know, uh, so yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. So it's about the system change. It's about the long term. Is it an issue in your companies? You want to go first? <laughs> <laughs> At the end of the day, I, she I, said I it's share. capitalism, you know, it's about the... the, the, the Margins I, and then oh. maybe yeah, yeah maybe can, I can no try, no try it's just a question no? for Sorry. them <laughs> no 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 uh, for you uh, for you uh, Daniel um, first. I, so yeah capitalism um, I think um, how we look at it from our point of view we're just a small company is try to stay as long as possible independent so if you don't have too many people on board investing money in it, only in it for the profit, then I think um, we'll be able to sort of, you know, pursue uh, a certain mission. And um, in a sense of what we do on a product level and, and how we sort of um, see it is that, um, for example, with cotton, we only use 100% cotton for one reason is that you can recycle it, sort of closing, um, closing the loop, as they say. Um, but also another thing which is important for us is sort of, you know, slowing down the loop. So if you have products that last longer or are made from a better quality or energy that is maybe renewable, then I think that sort of, you know, um, is something that uh, is important to us and also curious if how you guys um, see the future on energy for that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, system change. Yeah. <laughs> we only have ten minutes left, right? Yeah. No. Um, no, right. Now I think I th you have different types of capital, right? And, and I'm guessing you're referring to uh, to financial capital, which obviously is a very important driver for us. We need to pay uh, need to pay our revenues to the Swedish state. However, over time. Um, you do see that at least Vattenfall, because we are Swedish state-owned, there's uh, more impact towards the social capital rather than the financial capital. An example is uh, that we um, that we sold our lignite mines in Germany while they were wildly uh, profitable. We are phasing out our coal and we are moving into a more renewable base. Uh, as I said, in 2050, we want to be climate neutral. This isn't only because of a revenue issue of financial capital. This is because of social capital and we want to be a front runner there as well. Cool. Thank you. But uh, what you uh... Well, I think the the bottom line is is that it's not okay to profit from cheap Colombian coal for instance for our energy. Uh, and usually uh, as in this case as well, it's a situation, it's a bit of a David Goliath situation where you have uh, uh, humongous economic interest, big companies uh, uh, who have a lot of resources uh, versus smaller group of uh, 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 victims who are usually, uh, sorry to say, but ra rather uh, uh, ordinary people, farmers. So there's a, a great dis disbalance and what we can do is <laughs> make sure that they become stronger by supporting them and be smarter by pushing the right buttons so that um, uh, big companies will feel that it's not okay to do business in such a manner. <laughs> Patricia, what's your... Uh, yeah. Super quick. The uh, president of BlackRock, one of the largest investors in the world, recently made a comment about uh, saying that all of their investments, they're not just looking at from a financial perspective, but an ESG, environment, social governance perspective. And so they're now, as investors, putting pressure on companies, the social capital, as you said, to look at all types of impact and performance of those companies, not just financial. And I see that as a really, you know, we haven't heard it come so much from the mainstream investors. And yeah. even all of you, with your own investments, could uh, look and see what companies you're invested in and use your own pressure as investors. Yeah, and if I were here, you know, when, you are, when someone from BlackRock saying something like that, you know, I would say, I don't believe the guy. Just for the fact of the very fact he's from BlackRock, you know, he's the system, you know. 
fair. Fair. No, it's a good point, but let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Okay. Let's, you know, okay. Right? Yeah. Uh, since we have only five minutes remaining, first of all, you know, would you please hang around here if people want to talk to you? Yeah, is it okay? So, so that would be, you know, that's yeah. a promise. Okay. <laughs> At uh, my time. Now, this other thing is, you know, maybe it's the best, you know, to collect, you know, three questions, final questions, you know, and it's up to you when it's addressed to you, to pick one of those questions. Of course, the most difficult question, I hope, yeah. <laughs> so, raise your hand for the final questions. Over there, and I saw a question over there. Two, and that's it, yeah. Yeah, I have a question for Wouter. Um, how do you deal uh, with buyers from countries like, for example, Russia, India, Brazil, China, who don't care that much about blood calls and don't have very strong regulations, due diligence standards? Uh, what is your impact there, yeah. and how do you hold them accountable? Cool, thanks. Especially, yeah, how do you kill? Uh, yeah, and other question over there. <laughs> yes, over there, and then we can just call it a day, I guess, when it comes to questions. Yeah, over there. Yes. So, what for you? Hi. Mm, question for old people working on for ONGs. How much, in your experience, the problem is that companies, Western companies, don't have information, and m how much is that they need a stick to do what you want them to do? I mean, yes. like people you are ref talking with are also consumer in their usual life. You are ref talking with us, trying to trigger our social preferences. I can imagine that also workers and employees in those in enterprises yes. have social preferences you can trigger. Cool. So that's it, the final notes. Yeah. I guess Walter, yeah. Yeah, well, a very quick answer to you. Uh, we do not, uh, because we have to make choices. Yeah. And we made a very specific choice that we want to make a difference in the lives of thousands of people in that mining area. Yeah. Uh, so uh, uh, we do hope that it will have an effect if the standards from the insides are, are raised, that it will have an effect on Russian coal as well. Yeah. Which I do see hip happening. I, I do see the possibility. Yeah. Uh, Russia is actually uh, our largest uh, client, our largest share of coal in our portfolio. And in the report, we also said we're doing, going to do a similar exercise in Russia that's going to have a whole different problematic around the one in Colombia. In Colombia, there's a lot of NGO activity, there's a lot of information available, but in Russia, there's no information available. Uh, there's hardly any NGO activity, it's highly politicized. So it's going to be a whole different ballgame in uh, getting that prepared. Okay. But we, we are definitely looking, but well, this, yeah. going to Russia. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, th through investors, we usually get an investment uh, manager from the company side. And I really like to try to get to the other workers inside uh, who are working on supply chain because they're a lot closer to the procurement and understanding where all the materials come from. So that's where we aim our efforts. But I have seen, and I'll do a little plug for um, the Sustainable Apparel Coalition and the Social and Labor Convergence Project, which are bringing a variety of brands together. And even when we talk to a, like a trader and industry association, then you can uh, reach out and educate a whole bunch of brands all at the same time. If you haven't been to it yet, downtown Amsterdam is the, um, the Fashion for Good Center. Uh, that actually educates a lot of people both about the environmental impact as well as the social impact of their clothing. Okay, cool. Uh, Mira, may I ask you uh, the final question? Since it's your festival, you know, um, you know in a way, you know, um, having heard all these different stories, different aspects of the, the product chain, you know, um, if I you know, talk to you later on this evening, let's say about 11, 12 o'clock, you know, we are drinking, we are talking, and, you say, and I ask you, Mira, you know, what can I do? You know, I'm a consumer in Holland, you know, I'm a journalist, so I'm not probably one of the richest guys you know, in town. You know. How can I help you to do your job as Human Rights Watch the best? What would you tell me? I would say get informed, um, learn about where your clothes are coming from, where your phones are coming from, um, read up But about. I have a job, you know, I have a daily job, you know, but I cannot get informed. All of us about are looking at our phones all of the time. We're on Twitter, we're on Facebook, um, we're communicating with our friends and neighbors. If you take a little bit of time out of your daily schedule to get informed, that will help you make better choices uh, okay. about where your products are coming from. We also read the news. I would say, you know, that's also part of, uh, of an awareness of just what's going on in those places where your product is coming from yeah. also means that you're 
you're going to be, as a Dutch citizen, informed about uh, the products that you're buying. And it also means that you might be able to use your voice then in, in the processes, uh, the, the democratic processes here in the Netherlands where your government is accountable to you and you can ask them questions and I would encourage you to do so. Other parts of the world, that's not always the case, where, yeah. where citizens don't always have that voice, yeah. or they're, they're prosecuted or persecuted for, for raising their voice. And I'm just going to take us back to Kazakhstan for one moment, yes. where that is the case. Um, and that's really, that is, an, a, that is a very important tool <laughs> um, for, for ensuring, uh, human, or ensuring that human rights are respected. So. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, <laughs> So you will stay here. So uh, the final thing is, you know, uh, I would say something about the, the programs. Maybe you would be interested in. Uh, so now you cannot read that. So if uh, 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 quarter to six uh, challenges and opportunities uh, for environmental uh, activities. That's a discussion. Quarter to six, and, and at six o'clock there is a, a film. Uh, complicit with the Q&A afterwards, and tonight at half past eight um, till uh, half past eleven, there is a film ca called Silas Q&A uh, film and uh, Q&As, and the tickets are still available. Thank you very much, uh, Ronald. Thank you very much, uh, you and your team for your technical stuff. And I would like especially to thank uh, uh, Sarah van Eland for uh, all her work behind the scenes. Thank you very much, Sarah. And Yip, thank you very much as well, and thank you for your, um, yeah, for your good cooperation with this whole program. Thank you very much. Okay, bye bye. Okay, thank you all. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Yep, thank you all. Thank you.